What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining me today. In today's episode, we go in depth with Joey Barrington. Joey and I had a very comprehensive discussion about a whole host of issues. We were honest and upfront, but at the same time, it was lighthearted and humorous. Self deprecating in my case. Joey had a nice little low blow at PJ. Check it out further on in the interview. Overall, though, we talked about Joey's childhood growing up as the son to legendary Jonah Barrington. We talked about parent-child relationships, pressure, competition. We talked about coaching and perspective. We talked about Joey's amazing experiences with players like Rami Ashour, Jonathan Power, Amar Shabana. We talked about a fitness course, actually, that Joey is pushing out through squash skills starting tomorrow on Monday, January the 17th, if I got it right. Yes, I did. I just checked my calendar. So sign up for that if you guys are interested in taking your mobility, your stability, and your strength, squash specific, to the next level. We talked about social media. We talked about some of the changes and some of the potential roadmap items that Squash TV is looking at that will make our viewing and engagement and immersion and take it to the next level. So there's a ton of content in this interview. I hope that you guys watch it. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you approach it lightheartedly. As always, give the video a thumbs up, like it if you truly do like it at the end of it. Leave a comment. I'd love to hear any questions you have, any feedback you have. If you have questions for Joey, put them in there. We'll, I'll try to get him to respond to them. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. And if you think there's someone else who might enjoy this video, I would really appreciate it. And it would help a lot in terms of the creation of this content if you could share it with other friends and family. The more we can grow the channel, the more awesome content I can create for you guys. All right, guys, enjoy the video and have a good one. Take care. What's up, everyone? We have a very special guest in the house today, Joey Barrington. You guys recognize him. I know you do. <laughs> the man, the legend here with us. Joey, thank you for being here. Absolute pleasure. Sorry, uh, it took a bit of uh, maneuvering, but I am here <laughs> in true form. <laughs> that's it. That's it. You know, I feel it's the first time we're actively talking, but I feel like I know you because I see you on Squash TV all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty open on that as well. Probably uh, some of the stuff I talk about is probably not really. Uh, anyway, it, it is what it is, and we <laughs> enjoy what I do. Uh, but it, so. it, it makes for enjoyable viewing for us. So you know, keep keep the random stuff coming here and there. Squash, it's <laughs> it's a good eclectic mix. We love it. <laughs> so no, Joey, thanks for being here. And uh, guys, I have some awesome questions. I hope they turn out to be awesome questions lined up for Joey. We're going to talk about things from parenting to his experience playing to transition and pivoting through life and uh we're going to end with some fun fun little stats that you guys can leverage when it comes to fitness and joey's going to talk a bit about this awesome fitness program he's running through squash skills as well so uh we'll get to all of that in due time but the first thing i wanted to ask you about joey was around growing up having your dad legendary jonah barrington obviously and nowadays as i coach a lot of juniors, I see kids struggling, parents and kids struggling with relationships, uh, whether it's too much pressure from the parents, the kids are doing it because they're being pushed extrinsically. It's not coming so much intrinsically. I had my own challenges with my dad, obviously never reaching the same level or having a legendary player uh, in, in my father, but I had my own triggers with my dad when it came to squash and the things he said and stuff like that. So I was curious from your perspective, how did it feel having your dad being so successful kind of it, it, growing up in his wake almost and living up to his standards did you feel pressure like I'd love to hear more about your thoughts yeah I mean it's a really interesting um uh dynamic somebody else uh, a friend of mine got in touch with me recently saying about possibly writing a book about explaining mm -hmm. and uh, ex the experience of growing up with a kind of um sporting famous icon as a son but um it was I didn't really have very much time with him uh, he he was when I was very, very young, he was still playing, um, traveling a lot with his playing. And then when he finished playing, he started, he was coaching. So he's traveling a lot with his coaching. So mm. he's spending more time with other people's kids um, than, than, than me. Um, but I, I, I didn't really, I just got on with it. You know, I was quite, um, I had an older brother, um, sadly, who's passed, but he was a lot more sensitive to the situation with my father. For me, I 
had a bit more of an edge about me and I would get on and do things um, and get stuck in. And when he was around, it was, it was quite cool. It was nice that he was around and then, and then he was gone again type thing. So you, I was lucky enough to have a very strong um, and supportive, loving mother who herself was an ex-athlete in her own right, but had an amazing caring side. She sadly passed as well, um, September, uh, 2020. So it's had a bit of a hit with uh, those side of things, but yeah, it's, it's, I'm very standoffish having children myself and my son, who's at the school that I went to, which is a renowned sports school, but it also offers up a lot of other opportunities. I'm very standoffish with um, that side of things. And, it, and it's a very, very difficult uh, medium to, to broach if you want to have a uh, son or daughter playing a professional mm -hmm. sport as a matter of squash. I mean, the one thing I will say about squash is it's an individual sport. So it becomes less of a, there's more pressure because it's on you to win or lose. You're not backed up by your teammates. And as a youngster, I enjoyed playing. I didn't really play very much squash at all. I played a lot of team sports. They were my, that was what I enjoyed doing and what I loved. Um, and it is tough. And you, the American system is hugely um, driven. I'm not sure if it's to the same extent in Canada, but in America, for me, is the, the, the ultimate of that, where you see kids on a mission to get into college, parents wanting that. And that's what it's all about. And right. um, I, I really, yeah, I, I struggle with all of that, to be quite honest with you. You know, it's you have a, also have a situation where you have parents living through their children's right opportunities if the parents loved the sport but weren't particularly good at it so therefore they want to introduce that to their children and then they have they start living through their children and that's right. a very dangerous pathway to go down because when the child gets to an age where they can make their own decisions one they won't play that sport mm -hmm. anymore and probably hate it which is mm -hmm. the worst thing to go away hating a sport right they obviously not having a relationship with the parents or the right. parent um so, yeah, it's hard because obviously there are days as a parent where you need to motivate your children. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. Uh, and you've got to take them down to the courts. And if they lose and, you know, they're playing a match, you want to, you know, make sure they're right. great encouragement to play the next one. It can't be right. Right. You've lost. You don't like this anymore. We won't do it anymore. It's it's really difficult. The Tiger Woods um, <laughs> documentary that I watched was really fascinating about all that with, uh, you know, the pressure of the parent and uh, all that side of things and how it's all kind of obviously exploded. But um, yeah, it's very, very difficult. It's yeah, very, it's, very this, difficult. it's this fine line, right, of building and driving competitiveness, but at what cost, right? Like what is this, the trade-off? And this is it. And then you've got, you know, you've got children that go through that and they, they are able to kind of deal with it. And as they become adults and more you know more independently thinking for themselves mm -hmm. it doesn't leave such a scar um, right. you know it doesn't leave such a scar because they look back and they think of the opportunity the opportunity that was given to them the time that was sacrificed by the parents wanting right. to give the opportunity generally wanting to give it mm -hmm. um take away trying to live through your child necessarily but just wanting to offer up this opportunity that they might not have had from their own parents right um and then you get somebody quite special that might come along as able to have dealt with all that type of pressure right. and then being very appreciative to the parents for the sacrifices that were made. Right. But that's few and far between. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, I see a lot of kids that I coach over here and Canada is not nearly as competitive as it is in the United States. There is that same pathway that people are trying to follow to get into the Ivy League schools as well but uh, not nearly as much uh, as it is over there. But what I have seen from a lot of kids that have come from, uh, from Egypt and I'm originally from Pakistan, from Pakistan and like even, even North America for that matter, the parents, there's the part that you said, the parents are trying to realize their expectations and live their life through their child's accomplishments. But there's another side to it that I've noticed where it, it's, it ends up coming out in the kid, like you said, being overtrained, overburned, uh, hating the sport, quitting probably at 15, 16, not wanting to, to, to do it anymore at the end of the day, unfortunately, because of the parents push. But this is where the limiting beliefs come in from like the parents' childhood. And if they came a place, came from a place of lack, um, then the parent 
is coming with that belief and they're trying to push their child more and more because they're saying, Hey, you have all this opportunity that I never had. And, yeah. you know, you got to capitalize on it because it's, it's so on and so forth. And it's just this, it's almost this vicious cycle that unless we're aware of kind of some of the things that are driving us from deep down inside, it becomes really, really challenging to break, break that vicious cycle or even recognize that you're in a vicious cycle <laughs> to begin with. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, recognizing it's the first port of call for anything, you know, Yeah. Um, to be, you know, criticized about something and then think, surely that's not me. No, no, no. And, you know, right. See, but it is, I mean, I'm, as you're talking now, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of uh, my son, my son happens to be at a private school. I'm, you know, doing everything I can to try and keep him there. It's, yes. you know, it's an expensive situation. And, you know, I've been there in the car with him saying, look, this is, I'm giving you this opportunity. It's a very spe special opportunity. It's, mm. it's not his decision. He's there. It's my decision. If he wasn't happy there, then I'd take him and put him wherever, but he right. is happy to be happy there. But it's, again, it's like, you can't begrudge. Right. They're going to, you know, whatever they do, I mean, you give them the opportunity. If they take it, they maximize on what you've done. And that's yes. amazing. If they don't, then, you know, right. it's, you know, you can't then, Hold it. it's really tough yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the bottom line it's so tough because you know it it's, it's funny and there's, no, there's so much gray area in there and you know i think the more open people are sometimes with it all i think that that's how they can help each other you know uh, well that's right and it's funny because my parents were kind of the opposite spectrum funny enough is that even though we're originally from pakistan a lot of pakistani people are very kind of particular and forceful and meticulous that you have to you have to become an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it is my parents when i was growing up actually were very free in that yep. they didn't give me that much direction and that was that actually i feel ended up hindering me in some ways because i i did things and i pushed but i didn't have focus when i was doing it so i sort of did a bunch of everything and it i never excelled to that extent as I could have because I was so divided in my attention. So, you know, it's funny because that was, that's one extreme, but then the other extreme is what, what I see a, a lot now where the parents are so forceful about going and training five, six hours a day when you're, you know, 13, 14 years old, and then you have schoolwork and it's just go, 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 go. That I think is, in my opinion, another extreme, which we probably want to avoid as well. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Otherwise, yeah. where does the childhood go? It, yeah. It, it, even a childhood really. Yeah, exactly. Well, no. no, you know, it's interesting. I mean, interesting to hear about your, your childhood with your dad, because I, I mean, I didn't know that, obviously, um, that, that the influence was there, but it wasn't as much kind of hands on time and attention. So I, I guess that there was never, it sounds like there was never that kind of, um, you were never living in a shadow, per se, you weren't trying to live up to his expectations. No, no, I, 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 um, I, I wasn't that tuned into squash at all. Um, mm. That my squash um, journey came about through a lot of bizarre situations. Um, so I wasn't mapped out to do what I did as a professional squash player, and then and then move on and do, do the TV side of things at all. That wasn't my. I didn't, you know, sit down and think I was going to be doing that at a certain age. Not a chance. Um, and that's why I want to give you know for people out there as well, and just trying to break this whole mold of you know you've got to specialize got to do this you've got right. to do that at such a young age with the pressure that comes with it you know you change as a person and what uh what you see um and what you want to get out of life and you need to let that evolve um i think mm -hmm. that's really important of course you're always going to have the people that will see what they want to do at a very young age and just right. be absolutely regimented right. on that um and you'll always have that but yeah general majority um duck it duck in and out of things but yes. My dad didn't really take me seriously from the squash point of view until, till I started to really um, kind of clean my lifestyle up at university mm. and and start to um, kind of play just once a day. It was the start of just once a day, let right. alone twice a day. The twice a day came in a lot later on for me, uh, training wise and stuff. But um, mm. and then he started to um, started to kick in with his his knowledge and his support. Um, and the other side of the coin of that was when I did declare as a professional squash player and it was my job and that's what I was going to do. Um, mm -hmm. then I got the, the, the kind of the hard six time world champion, British open champion side of, right. 
you know, there's been there's been stories and things that have happened when I've had losses and different things where he hasn't actually spoken to me and told me I'm not welcome home. So oh wow, back in the day, it was hardcore. Yeah, yeah. No, really <laughs> cool. Again, I was a grown adult making my decisions as a professional right. sports player, and his and he was, you know, it's your job and this is life. And and he, so he, yeah, he he got stuck into me, but it was for my benefit. It wasn't right. out of a nasty, malicious kind of let down point of view from his point of view. Right, right. And it's, it's interesting. I mean, as a coach, I don't know how much coaching you do now, uh, but as a coach, you have to be very sensitive to different people's approaches to things, right? Like some people will thrive off of that, you know, just straight up truth and honesty, or maybe even go above and beyond and say, you're not welcome home, for example, because maybe he'll real your dad might've realized that that is what inspires and motivates you. But then there are other kids who, if you say that, like they're broken, they're done. Right. So I think the art of coaching is it's really critical to uh, to discern what works for whom. Um, any any advice on, on that? Like, how do you have you had that? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, it's really good. You're breaking it down and making it very kind of clear, which is wonderful. And um, yeah, it, the, the, a key to a good coach is knowing who they're coaching. You know, knowing the personality, as you just said, yes. and different. And they could have, you could have a group of obviously coaching. Yes. girls boys different personalities within genders um and then you've got within that group as well and and it's it's finding um what works and and utilizing that and that's a skill in its own right let alone just right. your knowledge about squash and technique and all those things right and you're dealing with people young people primarily um which is the most important part of any type of development at that stage so my yeah, my shout out to coaches out there is to really get to know and understand who you're coaching, mm-hmm. uh, and have and, and know a bit more about the background as well. You know, right. without going too much into you know personal matters with that, but to understand the dynamic of the parents and mm-hmm. and to have um, confidence in yourself as a coach if you are very good at deciphering that and not to be swayed by blinded parents' opinions. You know, right. you are the professional. Back yourself. You know, right. I always. I feel particularly, again, going back to the States, if you have these people in different professions, lawyers, doctors, and they give you their opinion, right? that's their opinion. You right. second opinion on the medical side, but I feel squash coaches for me, and it, it's a real, it, it definitely is a bugbear for me, particularly in the States. They are um, kind of superseded by what the parents right. feel and the parents input. And these are people that have never played squash in their lives. Yes. All right. So, you know, it's it that does annoy me a little bit. And I feel that parent, you know, that coaches need to be a bit more, a bit back themselves a little bit more, um, you know, but it is hard as well, because if yeah. you do then fall out with a client, then you lose, you know, so it's, yes, it's a weighing up of a lot of different things again. But um, yeah, I, I, you have confidence in what you do. And if you're yeah. a good coach, reading up, you're looking at a lot of stuff, you're watching a lot of uh, pro squash. Yeah. I, I feel there's a, enough. There's quite a lot of coach, which is I find sh- extraordinary, really, because that's the best way for any of us to learn, really, yeah, about exactly. the game. You know, you've you've said so many things, which are, which <laughs> speak directly to my experience as well. Because for many years, I had that same experience where parents are coming in, and parents that might be very successful in their careers have this belief in their minds that hey, I've been successful here, so I know everything basically or i know my kids so i know what you need to do with my kid um and and for a while when i didn't have as much confidence and i was younger i would listen to what the coach was so to what the parent was saying and i would essentially mold what i was doing to the parents decisions and desires essentially and then as i became more confident and i matured a little bit more as a human being then i started then, then it was about respectfully having that communication so that because you're right you you have the financial side of it because if you lose the client well that's your your livelihood if you're only coaching and but if you do exactly what the parent says you're doing a disservice to the child because you're not helping them achieve their potential so in some circumstances definitely yeah yeah yeah, and, and and i mean the thing for me that helped a ton was when i watch a lot of pro squash i analyze a lot of pro squash then you end up just building your own confidence to say hey 
my beliefs are being reflected, at least from a technical standpoint, it's really easy to see your beliefs technically are being reflected in what the pros are doing on video when they're playing their matches. And the other side, you know, you know, the mental and all that kind of stuff is the hardest thing to do. But for most coaches, unless you're training very high level athletes, you don't really need to be an expert on the mental side of it. Uh, the, the higher in level you go, obviously that becomes more important, but, yeah. but no, I, I agree. I think confidence confidence is key we have so many resources out there my hope is through conversations like this we can also raise people's awareness and confidence related to different aspects of coaching of parenting the one thing i did want to mention really quickly that you started off with where you said you started playing squash a lot later and you played multiple team sports when you were younger and i think that's one thing and you did mention this that people are specializing too much too early and i think a lot of research actually shows as well that by being diverse and multi faceted when you're younger you actually become a better athlete when, when you're younger and then it helps you when you grow up <laughs> definitely i mean you're testing yourself in all different areas the, the areas of the brain are being developed in a different way uh that your body you know if you're growing up playing a unilateral sport like mm -hmm. squash you know, the imbalances you have in your body from a young age when it's mm -hmm. when it's developing is huge this is yes. something again this when we talk about later about my stuff you know i i study <laughs> I'm, it's the first time this year I'm actually doing, I have coached in the past, of course, and I've done a lot of, I, I was lucky enough as of growing up to when I was playing to be involved in my dad's camps, mm -hmm. which was the ultimate learning um, tool for me working with kids, but also coaching. It was brilliant. I had it, you know, I was very, very lucky with that and, and made the most of it. But I studied um, sport and exercise science at university. So that was my, that was my, um, my passion and then you know now I'm working in tv and I, I do what I do and and, and, I, and I love that and uh, but I also have this other side that I haven't really utilized properly yet and right. it's, it's a huge passion for me so I am starting to go into that and you know it can be useful for any coaches simple things for that because you know again you're dealing with kids um I don't want to go through too many names and different things but there's yes. you know people that I do know who coach of uh, dealing with kids and stuff you know kids are going through quite a certain you know, development with bodies or slatters these things that right. parents that know everything but don't know everything <laughs> um are kind of ignoring and and um and it's dangerous and it's 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 you mm -hmm. know it's just it's it's an education and that's where the from a coaching point of view if you're, you're educated as a coach mm -hmm. in the right ways yes you can't be a, a, a you can be a coach and a physiotherapist or a physical therapist, but the more you know about oh. injury prevention and, um, inju and injuries that develop and grow and growing and adolescence and all those things, the better you're going to be as a coach and, and the more understanding you are. Um, right. You know, we're targeting this at, at the younger, um, the younger, but it's the same when if you're coaching older clients, you know, and you're okay. trying to protect them, but also for them to get that mad squash workout and that yeah. buzz of improving their squash but trying to prevent the injuries from happening right. which is huge and i've like my myself drawing board i've had so much i've got more scar tissue than um, <laughs> <Joe Frazier. laughs> well you know i didn't know that you uh, studied exercise physiology and exercise science so that's yeah really I, loved cool. it. I loved it i loved it it was wicked my maths and my physics uh, are dreadful my brain didn't <laughs> go into that area but uh, from the chemistry and biology and stuff I absolutely um, it was very scientific and I was lucky enough to get my dissertation published in the International Journal of Sports Nutrition um, oh, cool. the effects of creatine supplementation on competitive squash players so that was back in the uh, that was back in 1999 uh, okay. so it goes to show you know I was you know I was trying and looking at different things and it was really fascinating. Um, but yeah, no, so I'm, that's an area that I'm yeah. going to building again. Amazing. I mean, I, I want to take this down so many tangents, but I know that <laughs> I'm going to try to stick to the plan a little bit. I want to ask you about creatine because I've tried creatine a few different, on a few different occasions when I've been training. And personally, sure. I have not found any difference in how I feel and how I felt, how I recovered and my speed and my power. But I know many yeah. other people are very high responders. So it's very interesting. You know, you get some non-responders, some high responders. Yeah. My assumption is that everything else that I'm doing, if I'm eating well, if I'm sleeping correctly, if I'm doing my other recovery stuff, if I'm you know, being mindful and meditative and all that kind of stuff. I'm assuming that that probably plays some role in maybe the creatine not giving me that extra edge because I'm maybe close to kind of maximizing the controllable factors in my life. 
but well, I don't definitely. know. I hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, the, the creatine supplementation, it definitely works. Um, yeah. um, but again, there's so many variables that that happen with different um, fiber types. We yeah. all have, we all have, we're all comprised of different uh, amounts yeah. of muscle fibers, whether they're fast twitch, med intermediate, or, right. or slow twitch. Um, the uh, the creatine works on the on the fast twitch and right. the probably fast twitch and can be on the intermediary muscles as well. Uh, so you're telling you're telling me I'm full of slow twitch. <laughs> 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 That's why I can't fly around the court. It all makes sense. <laughs> oh, no. The only person I would say he was a fantastic squash player who he seemed to just always be in slow motion, but was in a wonderful squash player. Shahir is he? He was always oh, yeah. uh, he was uh, full of slow twitch, but he oh, was. Yeah. Always you know, he was a real, um, God, I had some battles with him. I had something yeah. going down my room, but, <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, there, it definitely, it definitely does work, but, yeah. uh, they, there can be a few little side effects from it as well. So, right. you know, it depends how much you want to, uh, improve your performance or whatever level and the possibility of other issues that might come in with muscle cramping and, and possibly, you know, a few little kidney things. If right. Right. Doing it regularly. Um, yeah. You have to cycle through it, right? Take it for a period yeah, of time. Take yeah, off. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But just to put it out there, creatine is a, uh, for people that are, are trying to look it up or, or they don't know what it is. It, it is, you find it in, in red meat it is it's yeah. something you eat. It's basically a food. Yes. So it's not like some, manufactured chemical right so, right yeah. yeah it's something that our body utilizes and creates and stuff anyway it's like that the whole creatine phosphate system is the extreme yeah. power system yeah. that we that we need it for system, yeah. yeah exactly exactly and i think i don't remember this off the top of my head but i think they've started testing creatine for a whole bunch of other kind of uh neurocognitive sort of issues huh. as well so it's it's apparently been from research been shown to help a lot with maybe even things like Alzheimer's or like memory and stuff like that. Okay. Don't quote me on exactly what it is, but there is, there are benefits related to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, but okay. So I know we, we were talking about stuff that we can learn when we watch squash and the technical side and all that is really simple. The, the part that always fascinates me the most is the mental side of it. And, and I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think at the highest of levels, the person who is mentally strongest, either best focus, most positive outlook, you know, tactically aware, all of those sorts of things is the one that wins. So if you look at the top four or five guys, they're probably fairly equal on most days, but the one who's a little bit more consistent, a little bit more in it, they're the one who comes out on top. So, you know, I remember I, I messaged this to you, like I watched a, a match of yours against Graham Riding uh, from the Pace Canadian Classic. I, I don't remember what year it was in, but it was early 2000s, mid 2000s. <laughs> yeah, 2005, six, something like that. And you were down like nine points or something, I think. And you won like eight, nine or 10 points in a row to win a game against Graham. And Graham was like top 20, reached world number 10, I think, at one point. Uh, you were, you were up to what, 24, I think, right? At your best, you got yeah, to the world yeah, 24. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, to tell, talk to me a little bit about like resilience or grit, mental toughness, concentration, focus, like that general gamut of mindset. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, just to break it down more simply, the, yeah. the, the attitude that I had, and this was from a young age and it wasn't, it was what I had inherently in me was to be obviously ultra competitive mm -hmm. and um, to later on try and channel that properly. Um, so when I was playing squash, every point to me was like match point. And I kind of say it in commentary and I, yes, at times there's people, you know, that, well, quite regularly that will concede quickly, yes. um, but then bounce back. Then I, that wasn't my mindset. I always fought and fought, even if I was right. down and out with whatever opportunity, um, because you never know what can happen. Right. And it's extraordinary what can then happen when you start to slightly relax, not as in willy nilly stuff, but relax yes. more in, in everything and then just let it flow. Yes. The potential of what you have as a player and a person is, is un unreal. Uh, you know, right. they call it being in the zone. Yes. Um, and you know, that, that, that side of things was never an issue for me to be motivated to, to push. So that mm. wasn't what I had. The issue I had was nerves. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself hmm. because of what I wanted to achieve. Yes, there was exterior pressure when I was a professional because right. of my name and my background. Of course, I was, you know, it was like I was on court and people were going to 
possibly start to have, just have a look for you know a few minutes or the whole match or whatever it may be to see because of my my name. Um, yes. But that was what I signed up. You know, that was I knew that was going to be the situation when I declared I was going to be a professional squash player. So it's right. like I can't just sit there and whinge about it. Right. It's like that situation. Yes, I have a very famous father. Yes, this that. I'm doing this for me. It's for my my journey, my challenge, and what I want to achieve. But I I used to get nervous because I I wanted to win so much mm. um, for a you know for a lot of personal um, just personal reasons. I was so competitive, and I I, mm. I would get nervous. And I I do feel that although having the team background, because I didn't play the individual squash and mm. the the junior level squash, right. um, I didn't have that mental rehearsal of going in tournament in tournament out, you know, like a lot of these youngsters that are playing basically, I feel like a career before they even become. <laughs> right. You right. Know? So you, the youngsters that come on into, into, you know, say Mustafa Asal at the moment, or whatever, he's one of so many of the youngsters that have come through from a young mm -hmm. age, all these great players and, you know, second nature to them, not right. really going to get this because they've been at the highest level, won at the highest level and competed at the highest level right. within their unit and then moved on. So, so the mental side of things for me was was nerves, and right. I think you can see you you saw I saw a lot of that with Paul Cole as he was mm. pushing on through. There was that little window of period where he was right. getting very close to, right. to going through, and then there were this there was this breakdown and just the hitting of the ball and all sorts of different things, and right. and that was just purely down to nerves for him. Right, right. He's, mad. He's overcome that now. Right, right. And tell, like, you know, you mentioned competitiveness and you mentioned channeling competitiveness. So I'm curious to hear what you mean by channeling your competitiveness. And then I'd love to hear any strategies or tools that you use yourself to work past the nerves, because I had a very similar experience to you. I started playing a lot later. I obviously didn't reach your level on the professional circuit. I started playing a lot later. And because of that, I struggled mentally by putting high expectations and pressure on myself. And I could never bring out even close to my potential in tournaments. And it was something yeah. I struggled with for right. many, many so, years. So for instance, the level that you know you could play at practice, yeah. in practice matches, you know, again, when you were put in that tournament environment, it, was no, it wasn't, close to the level you play. Exactly. Before. And a lot of people struggle with that. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, strategies one can use to overcome that. I think it'll help a lot. Yeah. I mean, going from a physiological point of view, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the warm up is a, is a great tool initially to try to blow out any of the, um, uh, extra, you know, extra adrenaline and extra nerves that are coming in. So a really good dynamic warm up where you're breathing, you're opening up your chest because what happens when you do get nervous, mm -hmm. We've all been there at the beginning of matches. Yeah. Everything closes down and your chest gets uh, feels narrower. And then suddenly you feel like you've got, you're like the unfittest player in the world. <laughs> you're out, you're lethargic, you can't move. Right. Um, the lethargy can come in from also worrying about the match the night before, not sleeping well. Yep. All this builds up and builds up. It's, it's really, it's tough. Um, mm -hmm. But to channel the, to, 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 sorry, to deal with the nerves to start with, the warm up is a great tool, but when you when you start to to play, and this is a great tool to kind of use as you develop as a player. And if you get this right, the level your level in competitive player will go up. Is actually just getting in into the the mindset of what you need to be doing tactically and what your opponent's doing. Yeah. You then trick your mind out of the nerves of thinking about why you know I, I don't want to lose. I'm scared of losing yes. or with that and everything else. And you yes. and you. And that's what I think from a yes. simplistic manner. When you get into that mode, that's when you get in the zone a little bit. Yeah. If everything yeah. technically is working well. Yeah. You're moving decently. If you're thinking about what tactics you're doing, yeah. and you're also aware of what your opponent's doing, which is you know changing all the time within a squash game, mm -hmm. then you trick your mind out of that whole worrying about exterior factors. Yes. Also, not looking out. You know, I never used to really look out. Um, there's a lot of players that like to look out the back. Right. Never really looked out. I wasn't really aware who was watching. That right. was always good. When I was not aware of who was watching. Yes. Uh, in the live audience and around that, that was, I knew that I was in a good, ma a good mindset. Good mindset. And a good right. To probably get a, you know, 
Yeah, it's yeah. Just, I mean, I think everything you've mentioned is spot on, right? Like you're, I think you're talking about the work through, like because you, you, you know, it's an industry at the end of the day. You know, sports right. psychology is an industry, and yeah. it works brilliantly, and it's a massive part of sport today, particularly at the highest level, as you imagine. What separates you from from the you know the, the winning those big championships when you're in the top four when technique is there fitness yeah. is there, speed is there all these attributes that you need um and that's where my dad's so good with all that because he was um he had all this he worked it all out himself he right physical side he worked out that's in his book murder and the squash ball it's all about the mind the mental side of the game which is mm. fascinating and as i've got older and stood away and analyzed it from a um, commentary point of view, mm-hmm. I, I can see it because you see the story is so familiar. Right. And you see it, you see the vulnerability of these guys on these days, you know, you right. see what happens, you know, whether Ali Farag might get a bit shaky in a situation right. or, you know, Tarek Moman or, 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 you know, Muhammad sometimes, I mean, Muhammad's mental strength is, is, um, you know, the, Second bar yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know him better than anyone in, to, from the squash world. And hmm. you know, he, uh, not not as well as my dad, but uh, <laughs> close. But he, he, you know, it, again, it was always that fight. There's only been two matches, I would say, in his whole career where he had a head off and gave up for a couple of the games. Hmm. Um, apart from that, he's fought like, you know, right. you know like, fought like a dog all the way through. And, right. Um, yeah, that's one thing I admire about Muhammad a lot is he, he yeah, never he gives up. There. No, he, he, you know, he's and he, you know, he leaves it out there. And what's happening with him at the moment is hopefully things will come back his way. Um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the walls that he's hitting physically, which is yeah. a physical thing, yes, more than a mental thing. Um, yeah. And there'd be some mental side in there because of possible motivation, but it's more physical. Right. And, right. You know, to see someone like that go down like that it's right. it doesn't matter if you're a fan of him you just got to the sport's bigger than that and you've got to respect yeah. the situation of the sport and what they've achieved and what entertainment they bring you if you're not supporting um a certain player yeah there will be two players playing so you're always going to support one over the other probably yeah very rare that you'll have you might have two that you don't care who wins right. you don't like, or you might have one both that you really like and it's a bit difficult but as a squash fan you know that person that you don't like is bringing you the entertainment That's, because he's playing against the person you do like. You're so, right, right. You know, the situation, you know, of, of that. So, you know, you have to cut back all that layering of of what you don't like about them as a player or a person and realise that, you know, when they're achieving at the top level like they are, you've got to respect what they're doing. Right, you know, right, as, right. You know, as a player and a professional. Yeah, with, with Muhammad. I mean, I, I don't know Muhammad personally, but I for me, I just noticed that his physique – uh, he just looks a lot leaner than he used to be in the past and, and lean, not necessarily in a, in a strong lean. He looks like he's gotten a little bit weaker than he used yeah. to be. And, yeah, and maybe right. his training focus has shifted a little bit. That's led him to become a little bit weaker, but yeah, I'm assuming he's putting the gym work in to build his strength levels back up. Yeah. It's a really interesting point. I know he's been a lot stricter with his diet, very strict yeah. with his diet, and, you know, a lot of these guys, but it's a fine line between, you know, kind of, if you're happy, and relaxed off the court again, yeah. go to that situation yeah. and not overcomplicating everything. Right. Uh, then you will turn up and play. Uh, uh, you know, you'll be in a lot better uh, mind mindset. Yeah. To play. Yeah. The one, the piece you did mention that I was, I think there's a phrase that a lot of people talk about being process versus outcome based. And I think that's what you were referring to earlier when yeah. trying to get past the nerves where you're focusing on the, the tactical stuff and the process of what you yeah. need to do when you're on the yeah, court. Exactly. Rather than all these other being aware of, you know, this I have to win and this is the score and yeah. this is what's happening. And then the, the next round or the opponent. <laughs> exactly. What, what the opponent who you know how he's going on the other court necessarily all these things and right you know, it's that's that's what the um the, uh, i think you know a real key to being able to play freely yes um, and really really enjoy the moment out there um there were a couple of players i played against in my career where it was just an absolute beyond a pleasure no matter what happened um and they were a lot higher rank than me and achieved right. a lot more a lot more than I did, but it was <laughs> like um, coming up, it was a pretty zen experience. I had a couple of wins over either one of them, um, uh, but uh, primarily lost to them. But when I came off court, mm-hmm. it was a pretty um, high level moment of wow, 
if I could have squash matches like that on a regular occasion, I'd be a, <laughs> even if I was winning, I'd be a very happy, uh, happy man. Um, right. James Brock's one of them, and Omar Shaban is the other. Mm. Um, and it was an unbelievable experience, a fantastic experience. Um, yeah, and then and, and, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, I just, I just say, uh, just you know, I'm just talking as as we go, and you know, there'll be a, whatever level it will be, there will be that type of enjoyment factor of playing someone like that. And um, right, right. And there's this idea. I don't know if you've read much about uh, John Wooden. He was like a former UCLA basketball coach. Um, he's passed now, but he had this definition of success where he said and I'm paraphrasing, success is the peace of mind attained by knowing that you did the best that you were capable of at any given point in time. And I yeah. think that definition of success ties in very well to that flow state uh, and talks about controllable factors, because at the end of the day, you can just go do the best that you're capable of, whether the match unfolds in your favor or not is out of your control. For the most part, there could be a, a referee call, which is out of your, your, uh, your control. There could be a, you slip and you get a stroke called against you on match ball, your player, your opponent plays out of their skin. Like there's so many factors that are not in your control, but if you can do the best that you're capable of, then there's no regret. You leave it out on, all out on the court and you can come out of it win or lose with some level of contentment and some level of yeah. joy from, yeah. from what you did. Yeah, completely. I mean, yeah. you know, it becomes an emotional roller coaster otherwise. And, you know, right. if you're living life, you're living life through that and being dictated on whether winning or losing. Yes. Um, God. And, 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 and that's the majority of professional sports people do, you know, right. throughout their careers, you know, they're very happy. And then you get to the other stage where you're trying to balance out when you do have the great wins and you are mm -hmm. playing well is to keep that, balanced and not yes. go up you've got this otherwise you have this emotional spiking of these you know elated emotions that take yes. the toll on you and then yes. obviously the depression side of it as well and I, was, I went through that hugely um hmm. you know for me it was it was that was tough and to get the balance it's like yeah okay on to the right. next one you know this is again where you can see like the likes of paul, paul cole is a really lovely example of of the development and, and later development and, and seeing it. It's, it's very, the way his game has developed and the way he's gone from kind of month to month tournament to tournament. It, yes. It's really quite a, very clear if you know the sport to see what, how it's happening. It's nice. It's not just suddenly he hasn't disappeared for a while, come back and then like, God, it's all this and that. Right. It's, it's a very subtle, but very, um, it's a pro systematic progression. Yes. It's, it's a very, very systematic very, linear very progression. Systematic. And uh, it's great to see, and 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 it, that can be utilized by so many people, so many players at so many different yes. levels. And that that's the best part of watching Paul Cole, right? Because it's not like when you watch Rami Ashore, for example, it's exactly. like this guy's gone for six months and he comes back and he's blasting Knicks exactly. and fitter yeah. than ever. <laughs> like it makes no yeah. sense. It's like how do you emulate that? You can't emulate that. <laughs> coach players to you know hit shots like he did and everything else. You get these people that come along once in God knows how long, and they just. Yeah. Mavericks and I mean having played him I didn't I came I, I played him a couple of times and okay and it wasn't coming off being it was coming off being slightly freaked out because <laughs> it, it was stuff that he did that was like something out of the x-men it's like that, that was just really strange I, I don't understand how you did that and I don't know how you're over there or you've read that or you're behind me it was really weird oh um, wow and, and I had a few of those with Jonathan Power a little bit as well I didn't get to play him in a in a, an actual PSA match, we played a few practice matches, but there were a few times where, particularly when the players behind you, uh -huh. and you think you know where where they are, and then they're not, and then they're there and they've read it or whatever, and you just think, oh, that was really <laughs> strange, it's, uh, something a bit unnatural, you know. Uh, but, they, but really cool, obviously, really cool. Yeah, that's what why they have that exactly. That, the, you know the the enigma about them and stuff. And that did, did you ever did you ever talk to them, any of them about that? Like how yeah. how how can one develop that sense of awareness and that that level? It, it's just I mean, it, they're, they're, they're telltale signs, and there's natural telltale signs that they have. Yeah. They can't necessarily explain. So yes. they, what they would do is they'd be reading a body position of a person going yeah. into a shot or a movement or a position, and know that they're going to hit that shot from that position. Yes, um, and you know, there's a natural sixth sense with that as well. Yeah. Um, you can't, you can't really, you, you, you know, you can sit down and you can analyze. So Paul Cole will be analyzing with, with Rob Owen. Yes. Do such a great team together. Yeah. 
analyzing the what players do from different corners and shots and also possibly off the legs you know going in yes they go you know some players go off the left leg they'll always counter drop in that corner so right therefore his way of reading the game because he's not a natural reader of reader. the game is me, use, use method to break it down yes you know? whereas with the players like kind of Rami Shaw, Jonathan Power, it, it was um, it, it's in, in, instinct. triggered, yeah, tri triggered instinct, but also yeah. possible ability to be able to, you know, Shabana as well, mm -hmm. possible ability to be able to see things just that bit quicker process, that bit quicker, which at that level of sport, you know, we're talking milliseconds, it can make yeah. a huge difference to um, uh, a reading of a shot or or a movement onto a ball or whatever. Yes. Yes, I think I think the really cool part about this is that there is hope for all of us <laughs> because we don't have to have that sixth no, sense no, no. natural instinct because no, Paul no. Cole is the perfect example to show us no, that no. we can systematically break things down and you can have like I love Paul Cole's example because it's only now and I think he's 29. He's in his late 20s, right? 29, and, yeah. 29. So it's now after years of consistent incremental progress that he has reached where he's reached. And that, that just goes to show you the things that anyone can use for success are consistency, resilience, and like actually met methodically breaking things down with structure. That is something that can be replicated by anyone, but not everyone has the will to spend years and day after day to go get stuff done. Well, that's it. And, that, and that's a mental strength in its own right, because yes. it's, you know, the process is, you know, it's back to just the cliche words. Oh, it's too, it's too hard. It's too much of a grind. Too yeah. much of this. Too much. Of that. Yeah. And you know, you, the mindset where you're coming from is to try and better yourself every day in every exactly. aspect. I mean, and if you are doing that, and I wish more um, middle-aged men. I'm now middle-aged. <laughs> uh, I'm almost there. I think <laughs> I'll, I'll always be a Peter Pan, and that will. I'll always have a twinkle in my eye. As soon as that yeah. twinkle goes, then it's time for me to say goodbye to everyone. But hopefully. Right, right. For a while yet, but yeah. um, it, it you know that that's and that's where my father has been such an inspiration. He's eighty-one years of age now. Wow. He's still exercising every day. Amazing. We've had a lot of personal sadness in our family over the last five years, which right. has been dreadful with tragedies and all sorts. And he's, you know, he's there and he's doing what he's doing and the way he out his outlook on life. And it's fantastic. And you know, I see so many middle-aged guy it just becomes this you get to a certain thing everything slows down you know the, right. the, the pride in the physical appearance disappears sadly you know the fitness levels disappear yes right. there's time there's work there's family, but you know if you're able to try and get motivation and organization and balance you can right. conquer all of it to a degree right. and be the, and to be so much better for it and i'm i'm going through, through a bit of a process with that myself in terms of back to the physical side mm. because that's my therapy. that's my therapy for me right you know i sit i talk about squash it's fantastic but you know i'm sitting there talking i'm traveling a lot which is which is i'm not whinging about what i do it's one best job in the world you know if you're not playing but i'm traveling a lot i'm not around my family for x amount of days of the year um but I want to make the most of things. So, you know, yeah. I want to make sure I get my training in, in the morning and then I do my eight hours commentary and, 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 and these things, because that's right. my therapy. That's my, right. my brain chemistry is being designed to deal with five to six hours of exercise for X amount of years of my life as yes. a pro. And yes. when that thing comes to an end, it, mentally it's very, very tough. It's not just yeah. the competitive side. It's just, right. it's the, uh, the hormones and the, the physiological the, side of it. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I think um, it's it's interesting, right? Like this is all a way of life. And that's the way I look at it is like your entire life has been physically oriented. And yeah. that's just your way of life. It, it doesn't matter if you're doing commentary, you have to stay physically active because that's just part of who you are as a human being. Definitely. Now, you know, there, there's something else. We don't have to go down this road, but you know, there's the, uh, there's the other side of like identity and stuff. So a lot of people have crises at the end of say a squash career, because like what, the only thing I know myself being is a squash player. I'm, I'm a squash player. And if I'm not competing anymore, I'm no longer a squash player. So now you go through this existential crisis of, you know, what is my worth? What is my value? What is my purpose in life? What, what do I do next? And that's another tough journey. And I think, you know, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about pivoting. And maybe this is the perfect segue for that, because you played professionally 
and then you transitioned into commentary. And I know you said that none of this was necessarily planned. It just sort of happened because you pursued your passion, presumably. Um, yeah. And you just kind of kept excelling and getting better at what you were doing. Talk to me a little bit about that transition, maybe from professional squash to competing to commentating. And then also a little bit about decision-making and pivoting, because a lot of people struggle with there's, there's no such thing as perfect information. There's no certainty in life. And yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts around that in general. Yeah. I mean, the opportunity with, with the, the, the TV side of things, it was something, you know, my, I was, I'd always watched a lot of sport, all sorts right. of sports growing up. So I was always very, you know, cricket was a big thing for me. Um, I played, um, I had an opportunity to be a professional cricketer when I was oh, a teenager wow. and because of an injury, um, I had, I went back and studied and never played cricket again, went to university and, and that was, that was wow. the end of that. But I was on course to at least have a go as a professional cricketer when I was wow. 16 years old, but, and I listened to a huge amount of cricket. So just going back to the, you know, you, there's no sports where you have the whole um, test series of cricket. The, the, we'll have people hopefully watching this that have no idea about the rules of cricket, but right. you know, you're there for five days in a test. It's a five day event yeah. all day all day all the way through from 11 in the morning till 6 p.m 6 30 maybe 7 p.m depending on light and you've got this commentary going through on these professionals and and i was lucky enough to listen to all those wonderful commentators in the 80s and 90s in cricket so yeah. that was a big thing that that kind of um submerged in my psyche there okay. so i was always aware of commentary prop you know proper presenting commentary was always yes. in there um, and I was drawn to it in, when I was watching sports. And then I just got an opportunity. It was literally just because somebody couldn't do some commentary and I was very much in the heart of my career and I went and did some commentary for Sky and it, and it went down very well with uh, the people involved and I enjoyed it. And, and then suddenly it was like, oh, this, you know, if, if things could start to de develop with squash, this would be wonderful to do, you know. Um, and then with the creation of PSA Squash TV, I was basically thrown in the deep end, but the unique <laughs> side of it for me was compared to any other commentators was yes, I'd had the sports background, right? but you know, I, I had to just start learning how to, to commentate. And the unique side of it was I was still competing at the highest level right. and commentating. So for the first four years of Squash TV, I was still actively playing on the PSA world wow. tour, getting to play the best players in the world and then suddenly commentate. So I would literally be playing. I mean, it got to the stage where I thought maybe the PSA draws were being um, a little bit, I, won't go, <laughs> I might end up, there might be all sorts of weird stuff going out. But uh, <laughs> it was just very strange that I basically, for the for a series of events, I'd either be playing Nick Matthew or Rami Ashour in the first round of every tour. <laughs> Because as soon as I was out, I was obviously commentating. <laughs> commentating all day. <laughs> I said to humor about that because that was what, literally every major event was playing either the one or two in the world. Oh, um, man. But the great thing about it was you're there. You've got the respect to the players because you're, you're, you know, you're an ex-player playing against them. Right. Commentating on them. There's right. a whole world behind the scenes that right. social media right. um, sort of thing just doesn't get. And people don't understand. So you, you're going right. to get opinions and all the time and it's blowing up right. a lot in the squash world at the moment yeah and these people that are writing and will always write they don't know what goes on What's behind the professional tour they right. don't know the dynamic of the players they've got no idea of the dynamic of the players right and what's happening with certain people behind um, right. what you might see on the court is completely different to what you would see behind the scenes right and, you know, fingers crossed you know we'll get more of that because that's what i want to bring to to the viewers because you know there right. is a lot of fun stuff that happens behind the scenes there's a lot of drama there's a lot of cool stuff right uh, really insightful things and that's hopefully the development of squash tv and as the resources become bigger we're going to have a lot more of that behind the scenes to so that people are now watching right the matches because squash tv is you know it's a tv channel but it's primarily 95 percent it's just squash matches yeah yeah and to get that side of it so that people when they are watching the players they like or they don't like yeah. they get more of an understanding right of who these people are because what happens is they're watching a match they'll see a behavior in that match fine yeah. and and that might be a consistent behavioral pattern that's going on so they start to build up a, a profile on that player yeah. which is fair enough completely yeah. fair enough yeah 
and then they'll make the comments. Yeah. You know? It's like you can't stop people making comments. There's yeah. a lot of great positive comments and the negative comments, but you know, this is the world we live in. But yeah. from our point of view, what can we do? We can educate people on the on the players, on the sport, and hopefully more behind the scenes so they can understand what's happening and what the dynamic yeah. is. And you know, you know, and that, and that's what I'm really passionate about. And fingers yeah. crossed that will be the next phase of of squash TV, really. That would be amazing. And I mean, that one of the hopes that I'm trying to bring out, one of the things I'm trying to make real for people is some of those fundamental traits of just being compassionate or empathetic. And the thing is, like, we, we have never walked a mile in someone else's shoes, so we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And whether, you know, this, everything that you're saying is actually fantastic because it'll give everyone context, which, which is really helpful. The, the thing, most likely, even with context, people will still be opinionated, which is just oh, no, the no, fact no, and the reality. Yeah. yeah, that's not going to change. But I think, you know, if fundamentally, as human beings, we can all find that compassion we can all find empathy we can find those sorts of traits within us even in relationships like with my wife there are times where i'll be frustrated and part of me will be like man what the hell is going on right just just like anyone else would feel but then if we can try to be compassionate and say well or empathetic and say hey maybe something happened that i'm unaware of that is triggering her in this moment and making her feel a certain way. And she feels exactly the same way about me. And I'm sure you feel the same way with your, with your loved ones as well. If we yeah. can, if we can bring that mindset and that perspective of putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, I think the world will become a far kinder place uh, as a whole. There's going to be stories and there's drama and that's the yeah. world we live in, but it'd yeah. be nice. It would be nice if, it was about God, the epic battles or the yeah. so in the tennis analogy, you know, the, the Federer Nadal battles back in the day. And right. We have these things and it's just like, you know what, that just that that kind of eclipses the quality of the squash and what goes on and the and the, the kind of Rocky esque uh that we, vibe that we have within squash, which is yeah. so lucky to have that gladiatorial boxing whole thing. We're not separated by a net, they're on the court together. Yes. It's you're exposed in this glass court. You can't hide you, the yeah. emotion there. You can't hide anywhere. Yes. Um, and just kind of draw on that a bit more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from a professional point of view. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I, I 100% agree with you. The end of point of view, you know, in terms of the shop window at the professional end, yes. then, um, you know, that would be, you know, that would be cool, you know, to go yeah. on the forums and see, you know, the elation of the epics and, you know, yes. some, rocky-esque gifs and all these things and everything. right you can have people in life that it doesn't matter what you do they're never going to like you yeah for whatever reasons you know and never and that, that could be down to a lot of their you know their personal stuff but and it's like you can't change them you do what you do and let's go back exactly. to coaches again and, and whoever's doing what they do believe in what you do do it to the best yeah. of your abilities exactly. and you know the majority will see the light and that's mm -hmm. great and then there'll always be people that will not Want, like to listen to you, like to watch you play, right. um, you know, and, and those things. And, and that's, that's just the way it is. And I feel with everything, with the refereeing and all this stuff, everyone's, yeah. you know, reading a lot of stuff and yeah. it, and it's, it is causing, it is sadly causing a lot of problems um, mm. mentally for those people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's it's like well how do they get better like where's the constructive stuff and when that yeah. comes in great and utilize that and then there's nothing better than somebody that's improving you see that again and it's like well yeah. they are doing something they're improving they you know yeah. they're, they're trying to work on what they're doing yeah we're primarily commentating on mm. um we're, we're commentating on a worldwide feed uh, yeah. english commentary um yeah. a lot of english commentators but we're getting more diversified which is massively important it's hugely important yeah. for, for you know, for me is a, to have that there to bounce off of and, and to interest me. And, you yeah. know, it's a worldwide sport. So that's yeah. definitely the way that Squash TV is wanting to go anyway. Um, that's awesome. Uh, which is great. And, and you know, you, you, you're dealing with different cultures. You're dealing yeah. with different genders. Um, yeah. There's a yeah. lot to deal with. Uh, there's a lot to deal with. And you're there to entertain. Uh, you're there to inform. Yeah. Um, and get the balance between educating but also entertaining and you know it's 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 it, it's not for everyone i tell you criticism's good because you improve you know if Absolutely. you're minded you know you're going to improve you know you can't just sit on there and you, you know there's you've got to improve and, and constructive criticism is very very good yes. 
um, and we, you know, we've all got to improve, and I want to improve, and 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 that's you know that's my development going on. It's not like yeah. well, I've done this for ten or twelve years, and I've got yeah, I'm massively experienced. I've done huge amounts of matches. Nobody's ever done that in our sport. Yeah. The volume I've done, and and the crossover of um, generations and things, and but it's it's you know it's want it club together with the pos the positive sides and you know we've we, as commentators we're guilty of it when we're going after the referees with with right. decisions we feel are, uh, you know are completely wrong and yeah. at times they are brutally wrong um, yeah. and then it's like well, we have to point that out mm -hmm. because the majority can see that it is but they right. but there are certain referees that are improving and looking yeah. to improve and yeah. doing the mileage on yeah. watching the matches when they're not Refing. So when yeah. they're not at tournaments, there's key referees that are watching all the other tournaments. They're being mm -hmm. professional. And when you've got somebody that is being professional, putting the time and you've got to respect it. Yeah. And they are. Um, yes, some ex players could be wonderful referees. Some ex players could be dreadful referees. You've seen like the top players in the world when it comes to video reviews or some of the yeah. worst video review uh, right. uh, calls ever. And it's, right. and they walk back and they think, I can't believe it. And they do it time and time again. So, you know, the best squash players in the world are not the best coaches. Yes. Nowhere, near. Nowhere near. They can't, you know, there's all these different things. So it's not always about to have played the game is important mm -hmm. in any level. I think to have played the game as a coach, obviously to have played the game as a referee is important to understand it. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, to play the game as a, a physical trainer, as a, as a, as a strength and conditioning trainer. It's really important. I really feel that that's, that's a common denominator, common denominator. Yes. However, I, I, I just think that it's not the, it's not always the answer to have, yeah. to, you know, to have the X, X guys, you know, that are going to be the answer for being refs and stuff. I mean, imagine putting PJ in as a referee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to leave that one. I'm not commenting. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I would be no better, so I don't want to say anything. <laughs> Anytime I've had to referee a PSA match, I have been sweating buckets because I do yeah, not like being brutal. in the hot seat. I mean, it's not just that. You know, they've got to. They've also got to. They've got to have presentation skills. They've got yeah. to be able to speak clearly, uh, yeah. calmly. Yeah. Uh, sitting in an audience. I mean, yeah. again, weirdness of squash in yeah. a good way. This is a positive. Yes. Thing. I mean, putting a referee in at times uh, a very hostile crowd in the middle. <laughs> yeah. You don't get that in any other sport. They're either they're separated. They're not in the crowd. But this That's to me true. is a real positive. Yeah. I think it's positive because you're watching it as a TV spectacle, and it it makes it such an amazing. There's so many cool things about squash yeah. that can be turned from a pre presentation aspect into a more positive side. Um, you know, it's fine. I've never, I've never, I've for somehow, I've never thought of the fact that referees sit in the middle of the crowd and in every other sport they're separated. I've, I've never, it's never registered in my brain that that is something unique to squash, which is, you're absolutely right. And it's mega cool. So somebody yeah. that's not a squash player watching it on TV and it's like, <laughs> and you're, all, you're having this fiery match and you've yeah. got, you know, majority of the crowd going bonkers about one player and then you've yeah. got you know john buddy maserati who's you know sitting there <laughs> glowing with his amazing tan looking like he's an infrared um <laughs> infrared man and it's and, and he's dealing you know and it's just unbelievable i mean it, you just yeah. imagine in football the guy would be you know he'd, <laughs> he wouldn't be there anymore <laughs> he wouldn't be there anymore you know i mean it, all these oohs and ahs and they're dealing with it. I mean, but that yeah. can be turned into real positive. Yeah. I think from a TV presentation, yeah. from our point of view, like working with the referees um, more and linking in and getting that. And another really cool point is to have when they are talking backwards, back and forth, mm -hmm. when we get to the point where we're confident that these referees that are really making it, you know, a, a solid profession with what they're doing, right. uh, talking back amongst the video, you know, to have that as an audio, not to have us right. chirping away. Right. You know, what we feel. Take us out of that, right. and then you hear the referees go back and forth about was it a letter stroke? Yes. You know when they're doing the reviews. Yes. Which I think they do it in rugby and stuff, and it's brilliant. Wow. Um, and then we come back in, you know, rather than us doing it. You know, I, I, right. That's a, something that I hopefully will get changed sooner or rather. That would later. be pretty cool because then everyone can see and hear the thought process, and then there's total. Yeah, it's totally objective. As a view as well, it brings you more in. From exactly. your armchair couch into the game a bit exactly. more, getting more in. It's not just 
you know, us communicating to, right. to, um, you know, and working just a bit better, getting more, uh, higher, higher profile audio mics to hear a bit more of the murmurings of players. If they're maybe, you know, having a go at each other or, yeah. each other. but you know, just getting a bit more of that in to that experience. So ideally, if you're not there watching it live, you want to be immersed as in it. As you can. Yeah. You want to be get immersed in it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Let's, let's take a, let's take a little turn. The last thing yeah. I want to ask you, and it's related to some of the squash skill stuff that you're doing. Yes. So for anyone who doesn't know, Joey is putting out and delivering a fitness course. Is it six weeks long? It's six uh, weeks, six yeah. weeks six long. Weeks. Yeah. Fitness yeah. course being led by now we know someone who studied exercise physiology, exercise science. It's a passion of his. You can you can't quite tell, but I'm sure you're super buff under that shirt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm myself with the quantities of food, I like my food. But yeah. uh, there you go. <laughs> I'm in a good place at the moment with my training, so that's amazing, great. amazing. So I, what I wanted to do is, in a moment, tell us about the program. Before we get into that, for all of the fans out there. I wanted to get, you've been around, you've trained as a professional, your dad's a beast, you've, you're around all the top guys. Give us some idea of some of the fitness levels of some of these top players. So if I were to ask you something like, someone's doing court sprints, back and forth, back wall to front wall is one, front wall to back wall is two. How many court sprints are they doing in a minute? How much rest, how many sets of that would make up like a court sprint session? And obviously it depends. Preseason might be different from in season and all volume and all that kind of stuff. But on average, let's say. I mean, yeah. So, so just talking about like giving the court sprint example, yeah. one of the players who is retired now that was did a huge amount of that was David Palmer. Yeah. So David Palmer would um, do his 300 court sprints, 300 in 15 minutes, in 15 minutes. So that would be his 300 in a 15 minute allotted time. Going back to when, when I was training, um, and, and the players around me at that time, yeah. when we did do some court sprints, yeah. it, court sprints are a difficult one because they yeah. can be very, very hard on your body. Yeah, um, yeah. They, there's a lot of problems and you can yeah. go a bit too OTT with them because yeah. it's not a particularly great, great healthy exercise to yeah. be doing if you, um, but we'd be doing a hundred court sprints in around about kind of four, four forty, four forty five. Um, so okay. these targets are Paul Cole. If he did a hundred court sprints, he'd be looking, yeah, probably 440. He might squeeze a bit under there. Wow. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you could then rest and then repeat that possibly, yeah. possibly five times. Yeah. Um, wow. But they, go, so you guys, you guys would do chunks. You guys would go for yeah, a yeah. large number. I, you wouldn't might, do shorter yeah. sets and on off, on off kind of thing. No, I, I mean, you, yeah, I'll go, yeah, I mean, you break it up. I was just yeah. kind of giving times and targets. So you would, you know, you do your 30 seconds. So if you were yeah. doing 30 seconds court sprints, if you were able to bash out 14, in those with uh two you know two minutes rest repeat 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 wow. and you know that you've got the speed you you're really going again the problem with that is that the actual practical problems is you're smacking your wrists into yeah the exactly you know you you know it's things that aren't yeah, very intelligent yeah, yeah. Uh, ghosting wise and a nice ghosting one yeah. is number of shots played now you can follow patterns and you will get a gauge on exact what you're doing with the patterns and yep. shot patterns you're doing and there's numerous things you can do it's endless but yeah if you were to time yourself put some headphones on uh, listen to some music time yourself and try and do um 20 minutes non-stop actually start with five minutes even five minutes non-stop yep. ghosting but think you're actually playing a match so yep. it's a continual thing of rallies and drills and in your mind ghosting wise mm and patterns of movement, naturally moving, listening to music, uh, five minutes. If you're able to do kind of 100, and, 100 plus shots in five minutes, that's a nice, really strong fitness uh, yeah. test. Um, you could then break that up into chunks with a rest and repeat, or you could go, I used to do 45 minutes. When I was training for um, playing in Colombia um, for the altitude stuff and really working on really heavy endurance, I'd be mm -hmm. doing four, five minute nonstop ghosts a couple of wow. times. So you're looking at over 850 shots. Wow. That's Maybe incredible. more shots, depending on how, how, you know, how much you were kind of moving out. Right, right. Loads of shots. Yeah. The thing about that is you could do loads of quick shots. Yeah. yeah. No, but the th this is what's interesting about that is that that can be taxing because then you're using a different energy system. Energy, exactly. You can go out doing that. So if you're doing longer movements and less shots and then doing active quick ones as well and mixing yeah. it up, that's less training because that's more like a squash match. 
Right. Right. And that was my, my question for you was going to be, if you're doing 45 minutes continuously, that's, that's going to end up becoming more aerobic than anaerobic presumably because yeah. it's hard to maintain like a very high pace for that long. Exactly. Uh, so you go, you go a bit more steady. So you're working on yeah. you getting the specifics of what you need to be doing for yeah. playing squash, but yes, yeah. your aerobic system, you know, you've yeah. got different energy systems. Exactly. Um, I would say Paul Cole's training more so these days is, is, is quite, is, is quite anaerobic aerobic. There's obviously a load of explosive power in there as well, yeah. but he's, um, chopping and changing and the way that he's trained and utilized a bit, a bit of CrossFit Mm -hmm. for that. Now he's been working with Rob Owen. He's focusing a lot more on just squash stuff, specific stuff, not getting carried away with the CrossFit. I'm sure he'll go back to that after his career. Right. Uh, But he's got a great base of all the upper body work and everything and the whole, the whole side of it as well with that. Um, Joel making would be um, a really nice one to follow. He's done some bits on squash skills as well. Mm -hmm. He's, be a very very hard trainer yeah um, um but yeah no it's 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 you'd be surprised what sessions some of the guys do at the highest level mm-hmm. um and then and in terms of possibly how soft they might be and then how hard they might be as well so there, there, there's a mix yeah there's a mix of you know there is a mix of of different some of it is very, very, majority of it is impressive. Some of it would be surprisingly unimpressive. Right. Especially as players get older, right? Because yeah. as, you, as you're getting older, you're not doing the highly impressive stuff uh, with super speed and super power. It's more no, you, maintenance and prevention. Yeah. yeah. And tra- training around it, non-impact stuff when you can, yeah. and then using the actual matches to be a bit where you really test your body. Right, right, right. And, and it depends on each player and their, and their work and their build. Right. Like we yeah. already, we already said that I'm very slow twitch. So my, my workouts <laughs> might be very different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say with your, with your origins, I've not known a Pakistani squash player yeah. to be um, slow. So I think, yeah. Well, I, 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 I generally think that I'm. I would like to meet a Pakistani squash player who yeah. is not quick and is also not very flexible. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, the movement again. It probably must be going back to like the yoga side of things with, with that that part of the world, or whatever Maybe. it is. I mean, again, it's again with the Egyptian players. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is what's so fascinating about our sport is you've got like you've got cultural backgrounds, you've yeah. got body types, you've got you know the sizes, you've got weights, all these attri- all these things have become negative positive in terms yeah. of the physiological side, negative and positive. Um, it just makes it a complete, it's just such yes. an amazing plethora of all these different elements that yeah. come in. You know, you've not got your stereotypical body type. Right, right. You have other sports. You right. Know? You know, yeah, um, and there and there's like all the sociocultural stuff too, because in exactly. you know, in like Pakistan and stuff, there's far more poverty, for example, and you don't have access to the same degrees of resources and whatnot. Yeah. So for that reason as well, you don't have guys going and having access to gym equipment, for example. So they can't, they don't look bulkier and stronger physically the way, say, a Paul Cole might, because yeah. he does have access to the CrossFit yeah. gyms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, like there's so many factors that go into all there's this kind of stuff. Loads yeah, loads yeah. Loads yeah. Well, and, but, and, and stuff. there's loads of, loads of yeah. stuff. My, my laptop is running low and I'm going to... Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to tell us really quickly about the squash skills piece? Yeah, we get excited. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm teaming up with squash skills. It kicks off on the 17th of January. I think there's still one or two places available. Um, and I'm doing strength and stability. So, Amazing. and this is for all for everyone. It, it covers um, any any level of um, player wanting to improve, helping with injury prevention, which is massively important. Yeah. Um, but also understanding some really good strength and stability um, routines you can do that are going to be specific to your squash and really help you in squash and, and people that have, that aren't professional squash. The majority, all these people are not professional yeah. squash. Players, so they have lives of working families. Yeah. So it's being able to have a, a strength and, and stability routine that they can do where they're going to get results and not kill time and also resources. Because if you have a gym, yes, you can, fantastic if you don't there's still uh you can still take the course because there's there's exercises for everyone to do at home or in a gym wherever so uh it's a huge passion of mine i'm doing it with uh, gary nesbitt who who does a lot of the uh, uh, all the 
strength and conditioning for and fitness for squash skills very very knowledgeable reads up a lot it's got a lot of uh, knowledge on it and plays and plays more importantly plays squash himself to a decent level Great. so he understands so yeah it's um kicking off on the 17th of january so uh, i think there's still a few places so hopefully some awesome. couple of them sign up yeah there you go guys go check it out work out with joey and uh gary as well presumably behind the scenes maybe uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be great. Let me know how it goes afterwards. Really well, yeah. Joey, thank you for being here, man. That was awesome. Great to uh, chat with you in depth. I appreciate all the perspective, all the feedback, the context. I really appreciate it. No, I really appreciate your time. Wonderful what you're doing. Really massive respect with what you're doing. I wish there were more people like you doing what you're doing. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more with you and, and more chats. It's been good. Really cool.